excited. We're going to be in the book of John once again. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth of the Gospels. John's kind of the weirdo. He's not one of the synoptics. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptics, which means they're kind of similar. They have a lot of commonality, up to and upwards of 75% in common between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John, he just goes his own direction most of the time, which is great because I love the book of John. Probably my favorite book. Uh, I, I just really enjoy John and the way he thinks and the way he writes and the things he writes. And we're going to be in John uh, chapter 8, verses 12 through 30 today. And if you've got a Bible, they're under the chairs, or you can look on your phone or your iPad or whatever you've got. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. And let's read that. I'll read it to you, and you'll see it on the screen as well. Um, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him thereafter, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? Well, he said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will, be, or you will die in your sins. So they said to Him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But He who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from Him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he was saying these things, or as he was saying these things, it says that many believed in him. We've been working our way through the book of John, and as we've seen and been talking about here recently, as we work our way through this, Jesus has been at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, in this part of the story, the feast has just ended. We saw last week, they were at the very last day, the eighth day. Now, the, the feast has just ended, and suddenly there's this voice that says, I am the light of the world. And you need to know, understanding the Feast of Tabernacles, if you haven't been with us, that this Feast of Tabernacles was a big deal. Uh, it was one of three occasions where the Jews, no matter where they were, if at all possible, it didn't matter if they were in Judea, it didn't matter if they were in Galilee, it didn't matter if they were in the Diaspora and spread out throughout somewhere like Babylon or wherever else, wherever they might be, they were supposed to, and they tried hard to make their way to Jerusalem, uh, for these, these gatherings, for these occasions, for these events, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, for Pentecost, and, and for Passover. Those were the three big ones. And you may remember, as we've talked about this festival a little bit, uh, um, that it was kind of at a festival just like this, when, when Jesus was just a 12-year-old a boy, right? Uh, he's walking, he's among the throngs, among the crowd, and and, and eventually he gets lost among the crowd and his parents can't find him. You remember that story, right? Can you imagine the panic you would experience? I mean, it's bad enough to lose a child, but we just lost Jesus, right? Um, 
I, I can only imagine the, 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 the fear and worry and concern of his parents. And so at this time, Jerusalem is filled with thousands, and, and perhaps some estimate upwards towards million people. This is a, a huge gathering, a huge event. Um, it was believed that the town of Jerusalem easily quadrupled in size throughout these sorts of events. And that's just in the town. That's not including, there's not everybody could fit in all at once. So you got people in the outlying areas that have come and they'll go and visit the temple, but then they got to go somewhere else to stay and all that kind of stuff. And so, so it's a big deal and there's lots, lots, lots going on. And, and, and this festival of tabernacle, as we've talked, is, is a particularly joyful celebration. It was a, a special family time. Um, and, and it would go on for, for an entire week. And, and, and it was this remembrance of the Exodus, of course, as we've been talking about, as the Israelites were led out of Egypt. And, and this went on for a whole week, and, 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 and they would build these kind of ramshackle shacks up on their roofs that the kids lots of times would sleep in overnight as a remembrance of the time of walking in the wilderness and the desert. Because, of course, when they left Egypt and they were walking through the desert, they, they didn't have a chance to stop at REI and buy a backpacking tent or something, right? Uh, they, they had to build their shelter out of whatever they could find along the way. And so this was part of that, that remembrance. And so they would build these kind of structures out of palm leaves and palm trees and whatever they could kind of find. And they would sleep there and, and they would have uh, all kind of celebratory foods and feasts and meals. And it was just this wonderful, joyful time. And, and children would look for it, forward to it all year long. It, it was just really a, an enormous celebration. Uh, of this exodus of God's faithfulness to the people. And, and so this festival had these little reminders of the things that, that God had done in the past for the Jews. Um, we, we, we read in verse 20 where John gives a little clue. He says, these words he spoke in the treasury, right, where, where Jesus was teaching and speaking at this point in our passage today. It says, these words he spoke in the treasury. And that is to say that Jesus is, is teaching here in, in the treasury of the temple. Now, if you don't know your, your Old Testament temple, which I suspect is most of us, right? Uh, the temple was divided into some various different sections. When you first went to the Temple Mount, you'd walk into what was called the, the Court of the Gentiles. If you were a Gentile, you could enter into this part, but go no further. The punishment of, of passing from the temple area of the Gentiles into the next part, if you weren't a Jew, was death. And so... You could come, but you could only come so far. And so the first part you'd kind of get to is this area, this area for the Gentiles, this outer area of the temple courtyard, but that's as far as you could possibly, you and me, that's all we're going to get. We're going there. Um, and then inside of that, the, the next portion, the next area, the next segment, is the court of the women. And inside of that court, this is where this treasury would be found. Um, and in this treasury, this is where they had kind of like, like a trumpet-like, you know, almost think of like a tuba, right? Uh, a tuba-style receptacle where you would come and you could throw your offering into it and it would go down into a, a storage underneath of that area. It was secure. Um, if you've ever gone through a toll booth like in Chicago, right? Sometimes you can just throw your change in that bin out of your car window. Well, imagine that, but it's kind of like the shape of a trumpet and probably made out of brass or something like that. And, and this is where you brought your offerings as you came into the temples. And, and this is where, where Jesus would have heard the tinkle of, remember the story of the widow's mite? And she throws that very last coin she has in the whole world. And he would have heard that, 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 that plink or that thud or, or, or whatever sound that would have made as she brought this, this enormous offering yet... It was the smallest of currency. Um, that's, that's where he would have been when he heard that. Now this court of women, if you didn't study the layout of the temple, is open to the elements. I mean, it doesn't have a roof, right? And there's no roof over this courtyard. And, and during the Festival of Tabernacles, one of the traditions was that they would light candles on the floor of this area. And we're not talking just a couple of candles. There'd be candles everywhere. Lots of candles lit to burn throughout the entirety of, of this celebration. And so if one would go out, they'd replace it. But there was just candles everywhere on this floor uh, lighting this space, right? And, and, and if you came to Jerusalem and you were coming into town in the evening, you know, four or five miles out, it was said that you could kind of see this glow 
from inside of this courtyard up on the temple as it rose up above. So you could see that. And, and it's probably not far-fetched to imagine that if you were a family living in town, you might even go out of town to go and, and get a glimpse of this, right? Uh, like like uh, growing up in Sioux Falls, they now light the falls. And so you just make a trek there every so often just to see the beauty of the falls lit up at night. And so you can imagine just the splendor of this temple that's, the temple's quite, a, quite the thing to behold, and then it's, it's lit up with this candlelight glow in the evenings, right? Um, and so, pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool looking thing. And so, when this Feast of Tabernacles is all done, when it's all finished, when it's all over, um, when all the lights in this area have gone out, now all of a sudden, there's this voice. And it's saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now as I, as I read through John particularly, I just, I'm reminded that Jesus says the most extraordinary things at the most appropriate of times. Just as he had just done in chapter 7 uh, of John's Gospel, when, when the priests, remember, they were pouring water, they, they'd gone down to the pools of Siloam with these, these golden pitchers, so to speak, scooped up the waters, went marching through town. They go up to the temple and they get to the altar and they march around this altar seven times. And when they're done, they pour out this, this water around the altar as, as a drink offering, right? And, and it's in that context then that, that Jesus came and we saw this last week. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He's the one who gives living water, right? And so Jesus is saying something kind of similar once again this week. And I think Jesus is saying three different things in this passage. First of all, Jesus is, is he's passing on a comment here about our human condition. As Jesus says this, and he's talking about himself being the light of the world, he's, he's saying by implication what he thinks of our condition. That apart from Him, that apart from Jesus, that the human condition is hopeless darkness. That, that men and women, all of us, are in darkness. That our minds are darkened. That, that we're blind and we cannot see. By the way, the, the next story in the book of John is about a blind man who cannot see. Okay? John set these up in a, in a very intentional order. And, and if you study these stories, you, you, you begin to see and make some connections. There's some recurring themes that go throughout John's Gospel. One of which is that Jesus has come to dispel this darkness. And actually, this is a theme that John plants right at the very beginning, at, at the prologue, at the opening of his Gospel, if you remember back when we started studying the book of John. He, he starts talking about light at the very beginning of this book in John 1.17. He talks about how Jesus is coming into the world as the light of the world, and he dispels the darkness. Now what kind of darkness is Jesus talking about here? What kind of darkness is, is John talking about as he records these, these incidents? Well, I think he probably had at least two kinds of darkness that he was speaking about, that he had in mind. There, the darkness here, uh, it describes, relatively speaking, the Old Covenant. As they're transitioning from this, this Old Covenant in the Old Testament to the New Covenant, and, and that's what all these celebrations have been, this Festival of Tabernacles, one of these Old Testament things, and now Jesus is bringing in kind of this New Testament things. All, all the Old Testament celebrations, Tabernacle, Pentecost, and Passover, uh, all of those are what we would call in literature types of, of shadows. They're types, they're shadows, they're, they're, they're sketches, they're, they're preparations. Maybe you've seen one of these before. I don't know if you have. I've seen them. Uh, some people like have them on a coffee table. They're these big books, right? Books by famous artists. Books of their works. And, and in those books, uh, my wife's an art teacher, so I see these probably more than most people. I understand that. We don't have one. We don't even have a coffee table. That's neither here nor there. But, but you have these books, right? And you can page through them, and it'll, it'll be like, whether it's Michelangelo or Da Vinci or whomever. And, and, and sometimes it'll have this beautiful page of, of, of an amazing work, of painting, a, of whatever, a, a completed, 
you know, drawing or whatever. But in other places, you'll find just kind of this, a sketch, right? Um, and, and those sketches may or may not have ever been completed into a finished work. You know, artists are frequently sketching things. My, my wife, again, is an art teacher, and so she has students, uh, they have to keep a sketchbook as part of their art classes. And so they're constantly drawing and keeping track of those sorts of things. And, and, and these, these sketches may or may not ever come into existence in a full sense, but they begin to show, they begin to give you an idea of what may be coming, right? And the Old Testament and, and the Old Covenant, this Feast of Tabernacles, that was kind of like a sketch, so to speak, as opposed to the full drawing, the full painting. And it was relative darkness as opposed to light. And, and John has actually been telling this from the very beginning. He says it right in the prologue in the beginning of John 1. As I said, do you remember this part in John 1, 16 through 17? He says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then he says, and of his fullness we have received one blessing after another. Now, now John isn't saying that there wasn't any grace or there wasn't any truth in the Old Testament. He's not saying that. But he is saying that in comparison, it's like this old system is like darkness and Jesus coming is the light. And there is the, there's the, the, the preparation, which is the old, and the fullness, which is the new. There is relative darkness and then there is light. And Jesus is perhaps saying uh, at the end of this festival of tabernacles, if you would just put your trust in me, you'll never need to celebrate this feast again because it's coming to an end. This temple is going to be torn down, he says elsewhere, right? And we know that the veil of the temple is going to be, be rent from the bottom all the way to the top. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But perhaps more importantly, Jesus is speaking of darkness in another way. Maybe a, a, a more personal way, in a more ex, ex, experiential ex, sort of way. He, he's speaking about darkness in the sense that there's a darkness that lies in the human heart. There's darkness in our natural man's heart. Darkness in our heart, darkness in our mind. Remember way back in chapter 3? Jesus encountered Nicodemus, right? Remember Nicodemus? And when he encounters Nicodemus, he says to him, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You remember what Jesus, or what Nicodemus said to Jesus at that point? It, it, it's a, kind of a funny thing almost. It almost makes you smile. Nicodemus says to Jesus, I don't understand what you're talking about. Jesus says, unless you come into the kingdom, you can't understand. And then Nicodemus is again like, I don't understand what you're saying. And Jesus is like, unless a man is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is kind of going, I hear you talking, but I don't understand it. Right? I mean, it's like a cloud. He doesn't, he doesn't, doesn't quite get it. And, and that's emblematic of this this darkness, this fog, this blindness that, that we live in. And now here Jesus is at this end of the Feast of Tabernacles when all of the candle lights have gone out, when all the candle lights have burned to their end and they're done. And then there's this, I like to imagine a booming voice of God, that Morgan Freeman voice of God, right? I am the light of the world, right? Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. And he says, if you believe in me, you'll walk out of the darkness and into the sunshine of a new life of glory and inheritance. Has it, has it ever dawned fully on you that without Jesus we walk in darkness? We do. The second thing that, that Jesus is kind of talking about here, the second point he's making, let's look at the statement that he makes. Not only does he say something about the human condition, but he tells us something about himself, about his own person, by way of the, the self-revelation that he now gives when he says, I am the light of the world. What does Jesus mean when he says that? 
For John, light is a buzzword of sorts. Like life, like true, and like fullness, if you study the book of John, light is one of these kind of indicator marker words. They're buzzwords for, for John. John loved those words. If you remember back in the first chapter, and it's so important for us to understand the rest of the Gospel of John from this, the prologue, kind of the entry, the beginning, the prologue at the beginning, uh, sets up everything, and it talks about how John is contrasting John the Baptist and Jesus, if you remember that. And he's saying that, that John was a light, but he wasn't the true light. That the true light is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who, who lightens every man who comes into the world. And it's an extraordinary statement that John makes in that prologue about Jesus. That, that he brings light to every man who comes into the world. So what Jesus is saying when he says, I am the light of the world, is first of all he's saying, I fulfill that prophecy. That he's actually fulfilling a prophecy. We read about that prophecy when it, when it comes at Christmas time, when we read Isaiah 9. The people who dwelt in darkness have seen a great light, and upon them the light has shined, it says there. And Jesus is saying, I'm that guy. I am that light. I am the one whom the Old Testament speaks about. I am the one that fulfills those prophecies. I am the fulfillment of, of every promise of the Messiah in the Old Testament. I am He. And it's one of the, the great claims of Jesus that, that He fulfills these promises. This is what gets Him in trouble with the Jews of His day. That He keeps saying that I am these things. That I am that guy. That I am, right? That I fulfill these prophecies from the Old Testament. They're all talking about me. They find their fulfillment in me. I am the light. But he's saying perhaps more than just that. Because he's saying that the world is in darkness as well. That as natural man, we, we live in darkness. If you're following along, look at verse 13. The Pharisees are incensed once again, or continue to be incensed, in fact. They, 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 they're just, they're livid. They are so angry at Jesus. They've been wanting to kill him for some time at this point in the story, right? They haven't taken any action, but they want him dead. And so, they say, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony, it's not true, right? You can kind of see these these grumpy, probably, you know, fancy robed, because these were the important religious bigwigs of the day. Probably had those big beards, right? Just scowling. Kind of with that, get off my lawn look, right? Looking at Jesus. You're bearing false witness. Your testimony isn't true. You can hear the, the rancor in their voice. They understood that he was claiming to be the one who led the people of God out of Egypt. Led them into the exodus, into the wilderness, and into the promised land. They understood that's what he was claiming. Now to be part of this festival of tabernacles was the remembrance of this exodus period as I was talking about. And part of that exodus period, remember what led the people through the desert? A pillar of light, right? Burning bright that the people could see and follow and know that God was there with them. There was light for the people. And Jesus is saying, that was me. And the Pharisees are getting awfully angry about it. I am that light. I am the one... Who, who leads the people of God into the ways of salvation and into the way of truth and into the way of fullness. Jesus is saying, for those who are in darkness, I am the one who deals with that darkness. And I always have. They don't like that. 
And you know how he deals with that darkness? That darkness of our human soul? You remember how, remember how the Gospels speak of Calvary? When they, when they nail him upon a tree up on the cross, right? There comes a moment in the experience of Jesus when he's lifted up from the earth on that cross and there for three hours comes darkness. In the middle of the day, right? If you've studied your Bible, we'll talk about this come Easter time. In the middle of the day, Jerusalem was dark. And what was happening? Jesus was taking upon himself the darkness of our human condition. As our, our sin, as our, as our guilt, as our transgressions were imputed upon Jesus, were put upon Jesus, were placed upon Jesus. In the midst of that darkness, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you for, forsaken me? And the answer that he didn't hear was because he entered into the darkness of our human condition. And he became our substitute so that you and I, by faith in him, can walk into the sunshine of eternal life. The world went dark as Jesus died. But it didn't stay that way. Did you know if you study your Bible, you know this. But did you know there's no night or day in heaven? Did you know that? There's no night or day in heaven. Because Jesus is the light. He is the only light we will need. And John carries this imagery throughout all of his writings, beginning to end. So John is effectively painting a picture here for us. But he's saying more than just that too when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Because as he says this, Jesus is claiming to be absolute deity. you understand that? God is what? When John writes his first epistle, John writes, God is light. See, Jesus, Jesus is the radiance. Jesus is the radiant splendor of the glory of God. It says that in Hebrews in the first chapter. I am the light of the world. I am the radiance of the glory of God. That's what Jesus is saying. That's why the Pharisees are complaining. The Jesus, Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees are like, buddy, talk is cheap. Right? They don't believe him. Right? Who are you? Who? Who are you to be saying these sorts of things, buddy? Right? You can imagine them looking down on Jesus as they... they you can't testify about yourself. That doesn't count. It's not true what you're saying. Talk is cheap, pal. It's kind of like on TV, though. On those shows where they're like, if you watch those like law shows, they always bring in some expert witness, right? Always. And like, this expert witness knows more about this subject than anybody else on the entire planet, right? And it's always some crazy, obscure thing that you're like, people study that? I guess so. And so on these shows, they bring in all these expert witnesses, somebody who knows more than anybody else, basically. And do you get what Jesus is saying here? It's quite astonishing. He's saying, I am an expert witness. I'm an expert witness about God. I'm an expert witness about the Father, because that's my home. That's where I live. I can tell you what it's like. I can give you the details, because I've been there. I've eyewitnessed it. And it's breathtaking. And not only is Jesus an expert witness, but he says, there's another witness who backs me up on this. Right? What he's, what he's doing is Jesus is invoking the Old Testament law that says, by the mouth of two witnesses, something will be regarded as valid. And he says that the Father testifies of me. And he testifies of me when John the Baptist said, 
He testifies me of me through the miracles that I do. He testifies of me through the Old Testament scriptures that I am fulfilling. And so since we have these two expert witnesses, and they both agree, Jesus is saying, my claim is valid. I am the light of the world. I am the splendid radiance of the glory of God. Now think about that for just a little minute. The good news, it's astonishing, that in a, a miserable, darkened world, that there's a light shining. A brilliant, brilliant light. You remember that, that moment in Lord of the Rings where Gandalf the Grey takes off his cloak and becomes Gandalf the White? Or, or if you're not of that generation. And Paul Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. We read this with my son this last year. When Pilgrim sets out from the city of destruction, he meets with Evangelist. Evangelist gives him a scroll, and on it is written the phrase that says, Flee from the wrath to come. Christian reads it, and he says to the evangelist, Where is there to flee to? And the evangelist says to him, You see yonder wicked gate. No, Pilgrim says, I don't see it. Where is it? Evangelist says, Do you see yonder light? Oh, yeah. Yes, I can see it. Well, then walk towards it. Or how about good old Hank Williams? I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. You can sing along. Here it comes. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Can we learn that by tonight, Sherry? <laughs> Praise the Lord, I saw the light, right? How about you? Have you known that? Have you seen that? Is that in your testimony? Can you say that? That, that you have seen the light that shines in the person of Jesus of Nazareth? That you have walked towards that light. That you have embraced that light. That He brought you out of the darkness of the human condition. That you have walked into the, the marvelous light, the liberty that is found there, the freedom that is given by His love in the gospel. Is that part of your story? Have you walked towards that light? Let's be clear about what Jesus is saying in this passage. He's describing the wonders and the joy of salvation. Jesus says some very stark things at the close of this passage. He says to the Jews and to the Pharisees especially, you will die in your sins. You will die, that is to say, under the judgment of God. Unless, unless your sins are covered, unless your sins are dealt with, unless payment is made, unless a redemption price has been paid, you will die to your sins, Jesus says to them. You will die under the judgment of God. Unless you believe in Jesus, you will die in your sins. Isn't that an incredible and terrifying and frightening and wonderful statement all in one? Darkness. Darkness is a terrible thing. I don't know if you've ever experienced darkness. I have on a number of occasions. I've been on cave tours, mine tours. One of the first mine tours I ever went on. You go down, you get your headlamp. Cave tours, right? If you go on a cave tour, lots of times they have lights for the stalactites and all the pretty things that sparkle and things like that. Cave tours are, are pretty cool. Mine tours are cool too, but they're very different. Most mine tours, they just give you a headlamp, right? So we're down in this mine, and we're way underground. And then, you know, as long as you got the light, wherever you look, everything's good. And we've made our way a ways in a number of different channels off into this mine. There's a gold mine that I was in. And we get to this place where, where the guide stops, and he says, All right, in just a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to turn off the light. We're going to experience just how dark it is. And then he talked about, he said, to save, 
to save uh, the, the, the lighting that they had back, this was way back in the day. He said, the men would sit here in the dark on all their breaks, they'd sit here in the dark and eat their lunch just by feel, so that they would have enough light to make it through their shift. So he says, all right, in just a minute, I'm going to have you all shut off the lights. And Before you do that, though, he says, there's a, a railing here. Grab onto that, because when all the lights go off, it can be very disorientating. So, all right, everybody grabs that, everybody reaches up, turns off his, their lights, his light's the last one on. He shuts it off. It's dark. Absolute darkness. There is no source of light. And we stand there. We have no idea how long he's going to make us stand there. And as you stand there, kind of that almost sense of vertigo begins to... You're, you're, you're thankful he told you to hold on to something, right? Then, of course, to make it exciting, he throws like a giant wood metal box on the ground and goes, BANG! You about have a heart attack and he turns his light back on, right? But darkness is a frightening thing. There was no ambient light whatsoever. Pitch black. And it was so dark underground there that, that as I was standing there, I'm holding onto the railing. I did this, like, like here, this. No, I could have been doing it back here for all I knew. That's how dark it was, right? Pitch black. Folks, that is the human condition without Jesus. Pitch black. Not even a ray of light. And Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. And if you believe in me, you will never, ever have to walk in darkness. Never again. And you need never experience an eternity of darkness and separation. I am the light of the world. An eternity of darkness awaits for those who don't know Jesus, who don't trust in Him. And Jesus comes when every other light has been extinguished. What this passage is saying to us, trust in that light. And the light shines in the person and the work of Jesus and nowhere else. Walk towards that light. Trust in it. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence now. And we just thank you for, for your light that shines in the midst of the darkness of this world. Again, we thank you, Lord, for your wisdom to send Jesus, knowing that we were lost in this darkness that we could not find our way on our own, that there was no chance, that there was no hope, that without someone to come with the light and guide us, that we were lost and wandering. And yet, God, you sent the light. You sent the light in the love of your life, the one you loved more than any other. You sent your Son, the one and only Jesus. And as he came into the world as light, he came to redeem us, to free us. But Lord, we have to walk towards that light. We have to choose to have that light within us. Well, God, on this day, maybe, maybe someone here has just been living in that darkness. Wandering, wondering, struggling. Lord, I pray in this moment that they would turn to the light. God, you tell us all we have to do is put our hope and trust in you, that you are our Redeemer. That you came into the world, not to condemn the world, but to free the world. So God, in this moment, maybe somebody here today has never done this before, but they just need to pray. Lord, my life is yours. God, right now, Jesus, I want you as my Savior. I want you as the light of my life that I've been walking in darkness, trying to do it on my own, trying to figure it out on my own, and Lord, that's only led to places and paths of darkness. Lord, I turn it over to you. I humbly submit to you. You are my God, and I will be your people. My hope and trust is in you.
and you alone. And God, as we put our hope and trust in you, I pray for that radiance of Jesus to shine through us. God, on this day, many of us have struggled. We're all like sheep that have gone astray, every one of us. And while we may have the light in our lives, we, not, we don't always pursue it and walk after it. So for those of us who already have the light, Lord, we, we turn away from the other dark things in our lives, from the sin, and repent of it. And again, we all turn to you. And God, you are so good. You keep taking us back. You keep forgiving us, allowing us to be fully in your family. So God, we thank you for the light. Lord, we no longer have to live in darkness. Praise the Lord, I found the light. God, as we go forth from this place, may we take that light into the world. May it shine brightly from us. May others see of your goodness and your glory. And may they want it for themselves as well. Thank you for your son, Jesus. We love you and praise you. In his name we pray. Amen. We'll have a prayer team up here at the front. If you need some prayer, if you just want to share, if maybe Jesus became your Lord and Savior today, you can share with them. They'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, go forth and take the light wherever you go. Let it shine forth brightly. Go and serve your King. Amen.